All right, cool. So yeah, that's me. And um, here to talk about parachain privacy. Uh, more generally, just on-chain privacy, why it really is important, and why everything is kind of broken right now. Um, that's me, again. And that's my dog. And uh, I kind of entered into the cloud computing or the cloud computing space back in 2011. Started my first company there, um, and been kind of building tech companies ever since. But around that 2011 time frame, I had a bunch of computers because I was, you know, running cloud servers, uh, doing a lot of testing on cloud servers. So I decided, okay, let's figure out some ways to cover the cost of these servers when I'm not doing anything. And so I got into Bitcoin mining. And since that time, did a bunch of other things. Built a trading platform, uh, did some blockchain research and writing, uh, went to go pursue my MBA at MIT, and that's where I met my co-founders. Um, because I was actually the, the teaching assistant for uh, the blockchain courses there under uh, Gary Gensler, who you guys may know as the chairman of the SEC. But, um, you know, we're... Anyway, uh, now I'm working on Manta Network because privacy is very important. Uh, and, and the issue about privacy is that um, we don't really think about it too much, right? We think that, oh, I haven't really been hacked or my identity hasn't been stolen, so it's not a problem for me. But by the time that happens, it's already too late. Uh, and so I, I just want to get a show of hands, right? Like, how many of you guys know that you've been exploited before in the past? Maybe your password's been hacked, your account's been taken advantage of, yeah? Okay, cool. Um, the rest of you don't know that you've been exploited in the past. <laughs> so there is a website. It's called haveibeenpwned.com. Uh, and so if you want to see just how many exploits you're actually a part of, check out that website and just enter your email and you'll see probably, I would probably be willing to bet at least 10 different exploits that your information was stolen. Um, and I, I wrote an article about this in 2017 and I think it's called like, sexual fetishes, gender identity, and a hundred other things we know about you through the internet. But more importantly, why is it important for Web3, right? I, I think this is, a, this is a philosophical question about where Web3 is headed. Uh, you get the same question back in like 2010, 2011 with Bitcoin, right? I'm saying it like I was there. I wasn't there back in 2010, 2011. But I would assume the conversation goes like, oh, we're just like a small cypherpunk community, so we're going to use Bitcoin for bad transactions. And then when you try to scale it out to the world in like 2015, 2016, people are like, oh, Bitcoin, you only really use that for like drugs and stuff, right? Okay, great. Now fast forward to 2022 and every single institutional fund in the world is trying to get their hands on Bitcoin and trying to figure out how Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other uh, crypto assets are being used as part of their sort of fund strategy. And also, um, this is part of the presentation because the rest of it is all private. Just kidding. Okay, perfect. We're back. All right. So for Web3, right, like we've, just as the conversation for Bitcoin has evolved, the conversation around privacy needs to evolve as well, because back in 2008, yes, you were a cypherpunk community, you were maybe buying drugs or gambling or something back then, but ever since then, Bitcoin has evolved, and so has blockchain, right? And after the release of Ethereum and turn completeness, now all of a sudden, we have applications on chain, right? Bitcoin wasn't built to support applications on chain, it was just built to create like some internet money. But now, with applications on-chain, you have data on-chain as well. You have people interacting with smart contracts. I can see exactly what you're doing. Um, you can see exactly what I'm doing. And so the point is that the privacy issue for Web3 is growing, and it hasn't been solved yet. But it's critical for adoption. I personally don't believe that you can scale Bitcoin, blockchain, Polkadot, to a billion users, much less three billion users, right? Like, without privacy, because that creates a lot of problems, right? We talk about growth, we talk about expansion and mainstream, we want to get to a billion users, but how do you get to that billion users when you can't build out the right use cases? And yeah, you say, we've got staking, which you know, takes our tokens and generates more of our tokens and gives them to people in like, the most like, financially sound way. And we've got you know, like, NFTs, which are like, currently JPEGs, and we're trying to figure out what else to do with them, just like back in 2017 with the ICO boom. OK, great. These are fun experiments, but like, how do you get to their use cases, guys? Like, on-chain payroll, right? We're, we're talking about that now, and it's starting to get some buzz. How are you going to do on-chain payroll for an enterprise company of like 10,000 people 
and keep all of that public, right? <laughs> everyone will be able to see exactly what you're doing, exactly how much you're paying everyone. But the issue isn't just about like your employees seeing you know, each other's pay, because you know, pay transparency, that's great and all, you know, more power to you. But it becomes a huge problem when you're a Walmart and you're competing against a Target, and now Target sees exactly how much you're paying your employees and how much they can offer as a counter to bring them over to the, right? Like, it, it creates a lot, of, um, a lot of corporate exposure. And that's a lot of risk that goes beyond just, like, pay transparency. NFT ownership and loyalty. Uh, how many of you guys own an NFT? Okay. How many of you guys have connected your NFT to Twitter? All right, that's great. That's great, because Twitter, mind you, is a for-profit company that's publicly traded that has fiduciary responsibility for its stakeholders, so all it wants to do is optimize its share price. And so, you know, Twitter starting to do NFTs on your profile picture is not because they're degen and they're cool and they want to be part of Web3, it's because they want to figure out how to monetize. And what better way to monetize than to figure out exactly how much money every single crypto user in Web3 has, right? And so by connecting your wallet address, they're now able to backlink it to all of your other identities and be able to see your assets, be able to see your NFTs, understand exactly you know, how to better target you as a user. You may like that, you may not. But I just want to make this point because there are ulterior motives for this type of activity, uh, especially when there's not any sort of privacy involved. Adult entertainment. I know this is you know, kind of a ooh, taboo sort of conversation, but the fact of the matter is that adult entertainment drives a lot of technical innovation, especially on the software side. Right? I mean, if you think about the adoption of the internet, I mean, I won't go into like the numbers and the specifics, but you know, who, who here doesn't believe the adult entertainment industry had anything to do with it? Okay, yeah, so about the same amount of people that you know, have NFTs on Twitter. Um, so the reality is that you know, it, it, it does drive a lot of innovation, but I probably don't have to go into examples of exactly why you know, adult entertainment needs a little bit of privacy. And finally, on-chain voting. Okay, this is what we all love because governance and every single token has a governance thing to it. Um, in my opinion, and you know, fight me, but uh, governance is broken. On-chain governance is, um, I'd say probably you'd be lucky to get 0.5% of your token supply to vote for any sort of proposal that you have. For those of you guys that have actually done on-chain proposals, you've probably seen this, right? It's kind of heavily concentrated in a handful of like very different small amount of whales that do all the voting. And the, the most sort of poignant case study here is uh, Solend, right? I mean, how many of you guys haven't heard of the recent Solend fiasco? LE, or not LE5, TLDR, Solend was like, hey, uh, markets are crashing. If we don't liquidate this whale, then we're going, to, uh, we're going to experience a terrible price situation with Solana. So we're going to put an on-chain governance proposal to take over this whale's account and liquidate it for him on his behalf or her behalf. Right? And so um, how did that vote turn out? 99.9% .9 voted yes and 0.1% voted no. But everyone in this room that actually just heard what I said is probably like, whoa, wait, like, why the heck would you do that? Well, it's because you know, the votes are heavily concentrated by one whale. If you look at the on-chain data, a million of the tokens that were used, which was like 99% of all the votes, was cast by one whale. But if you look through all the on-chain data, you see that there's a lot of whales with Solent. Why didn't they vote? There's a lot of problems with on-chain voting. Uh, especially when it's fully public, right? Uh, we hear this from founders all the time, uh, founders of like some of the largest DEXs uh, in the world. And they, they tell us that, you know, they, they get people from their community, whales, that say, hey, I want you to know that I'm actually not really in favor of this proposal, and, but I'm not going to vote on it because I don't want a witch hunt, right? I don't want the community to hate me because they, like, they have a lot of responsibility as a token holder, right? But they don't necessarily always want to be the representatives of the community. So now what you get is these people just don't vote at all. And so you don't get the true representation of the community, especially not with just 0.5% of the tokens, right? And so without a privacy aspect to this, being able to put someone in a virtual booth, for example, right? How can you truly get what the community wants 
right? Just like the, <laughs> just like the clap vote we did earlier, right? <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sure that not everyone has the most amazing time, right? We all have, we all have problems. I had some bowel issues this morning, so, you know, that, that lowered my ratings. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to express it publicly un until now. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, right, like, there's, there's certain things that could sway your own opinion, your own public opinion, uh, based on external factors, especially if these types of decisions are fully made public. And sure, like, we've got, again, you know, use cases where it's like, oh, should we add this new feature onto our decks? Yeah, sure, that's today. But if you want to scale out five to 10 years from now and really think about what the ecosystem looks like there, right? Like, I mean, who wouldn't want an entire country having their votes on chain? But how can an entire country have their votes on chain if everyone can see exactly what everyone else voted? Right? That, that, I, I personally feel like that would create more issues than, than, than solving problems. So hopefully this uh, helps you better understand exactly why on-chain privacy is necessary for Web3 adoption. But we want global adoption, right? This is where we, we say we want a billion users, we want three billion users. Um, but with that scenario, a billion users, three billion users, seven billion users, heck, maybe by the time we get to seven billion users, there's like 15 billion users on the planet. Um, I don't know, probably not at this growth rate. Although, you know, birth rates have in, in, uh, increased since COVID. But with that being said, uh, a billion on-chain users without any privacy means that there is a lot of opportunity for exploitation. Surveillance. Right? Surveillance, when you think about your own government, for example, you may say, oh, you know, I don't mind if my government surveilled me, or maybe you say you do. But in Web3 surveillance, it's no longer about one single government monitoring you, and it's about every single government in the world being able to monitor you and exploit it in whatever manner they find possible. Blackmail, you know, adult entertainment, enough said. Uh, stalking, right? Now all of a sudden, you're playing a Web3 game, and you have someone who wants to, you know, get a little bit too close for comfort, you go to a Starbucks and you buy a coffee, the coffee uh, transaction appears on chain, we know exactly where you went. And unauthorized profiling. This kind of goes back to surveillance, but in the interest of time, I won't get into too many uh, additional use cases. So with that being said, what is Manta Network? This is exactly what we do. We are building uh, on-chain privacy using zero-knowledge proofs. So what that means is that you can conduct your uh, transaction in a perfectly decentralized manner. Uh, while also being able to make sure that once that transaction, that information hits the chain, it's all shielded. So who sent what, who received what, the amount, the token identity, all that information is perfectly shielded. And so, you know, just kind of want to show off exactly what we've been building for the past two years. And so I'll go through a, like a really quick demo just in the interest of time. Um, and if you guys want to follow along, feel free to. If not, you know, we'll just kind of show off the UI and you know, do a little flashy stuff. But uh, the first step is uh, making sure that you can get the testnet tokens. And for all of you guys that want to uh, try it out later, you can go to mnt.as slash discord. That gets you into our discord community. And from there, you can go into our uh, faucet. And then from the faucet, you can just obtain tokens with the gimme dash some asset. Um, yeah. And so once you do that, right, we want to be able to privatize your tokens. So on Manta Network, just like on most privacy protocols, privacy itself should be optional. You may not necessarily want privacy for every single transaction, right? And so like being, being forced to uh, adopt privacy, I think, is just as um, unsustainable and unscalable as being forced to be fully transparent. And so at the end of the day, having the choice is very important. So with that being said, right, it, when you go to the Dolphin testnet, which you can go to mnt.as slash testnet, uh, you can select whichever crypto asset you want. Uh, these will start off uh, as parachain assets, and you can privatize those parachain assets. And so once you do that, you can actually send a private transaction. So you obtain a private asset, you're now able to send to whomever you want, uh, within the Polkadot ecosystem. And so you can use uh, a Polkadot formatted address, a Manta formatted address, et cetera, et cetera. And so we offer a lot of scalability here, as well as a lot of flexibility for users who are trying to transact with users on different parachains. I'm not going to wait for the entire video to complete, uh, but <laughs> you guys get the picture. Because um, you guys are all smart. 
Um, so congratulations, you've just made a uh, private transaction on Substrate, or you've just watched me make a private transaction on Substrate. And yes, at any time that you want, you can unprivatize those uh, tokens as well to get back to the original asset. Uh, but yeah, so with that being said, you know, that's basically my presentation. I hope that you, know, you understand now why privacy, especially on-chain privacy, is so important to the scalability of Web3. And with that being said, there, thus Manta Network, right, uh, working specifically within the Polkadot ecosystem is pertinent to the scalability of parachains uh, to the world. So, thank you all, appreciate it. I uh, got some time for a little bit of questions or not, I don't know. Okay, for those of you who have been here before, you know that drill, see this fell right here. Hands up, Mike comes to you, you can ask a question. We have one and then two. Um, it's about like the private box of like, it's nothing offensive. You want to ask the question, but you don't want me to know you asked it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I just want to ask. Um, so if you have the option to do private transactions, like shielded or unshielded, what do the blocks actually look like on the chain? And also, what does it mean for value extraction when you have uh, private and unprivate transactions or MEV? Uh, yes, good question. So it's two parts. The first part of the question is, what does this actually look like on chain? And the second part of the question is, how does this, what does this imply for MEV? Um, the first part of the question, I can answer you very easily. Just go to dolphin.subscan.io. Dolphin is our test net, and you can see all of our transactions that are both public and private. For the private transactions, what you'll see is that the information within the actual block explorer only shows you the zero-knowledge proof that's generated. And you can think of that almost like a hash in the sense that you, know, you can't really obtain any human readable information from it. So just check it out for yourself and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, again, that's dolphin.subscan.io. Uh, the second part of the question about MEV. So uh, does this solve MEV? No, it doesn't. Because minor extractable value at the end of the day, uh, especially when you're looking at a decentralized exchange, Right? Like a decentralized exchange requires uh, two variables. One is which token is being transacted, and two is uh, how much of that token is being transacted. Right? Because a, a decentralized exchange, they use you know, math to figure out the stuff. Exactly, yes. So you can look at the changes in balance of the pool, and you can see what sort of information or what sort of transactions are happening in the pool. For the DEX scenario, what would be obfuscated is the user-specific information. And so you're, you're kind of jumping a step ahead of me, um, and I love that, uh, where we're hiring right now. And um, <laughs> one of the things is what we're building out right now is uh, what we call programmable privacy. And so we want to be able to abstract all the privacy tool sets that we've built uh, to the application developer layer, which means the application developer themselves can decide, okay, I want to shield this and that, but not this and that, right? And so in the sense of a decentralized exchange, um, you have a decentralized exchange that can deploy, shield the transactor's identity, but the variables such as the token ID and the amount that's being transacted, that needs to be transparent. So long story short, no, it doesn't solve MEV. All right, Kenny, let's go ahead and go to the next question just so we can... <laughs> Sorry. This guy's asking. Sorry, we got to keep on moving. <laughs> hey. Um, so I think. Oh. Hey. <laughs> um, so I think we saw like a value transfer there, right? Sorry, what? I think we saw a value transfer. You transferred some token. Yes, yes. So which, uh, which transactions, like particularly when they're defined on another parachain, uh, parachain which transactions are going to be possible to privatize through Manta? Well, right now, uh, there are no transactions on other parachain networks specifically. What we use is you know, cross-chain messaging, right? XCM, for those of you guys that don't know. It's a specific protocol within Polkadot and Kusama uh, that allows you to uh, leverage other parachain assets. And so once we use XCM, those assets emerge on our network, and that's where the, that's where the transaction actually happens. Um, not just assets, but I can't get into too much detail about what else there is right now. <laughs> all right. That's all we have time for. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you so much, Kenny. Let's thank give you. a round of applause for Kenny.